Yeah, walking down memory lane in East Village, okay? And if you're a New Yorker, you know exactly what that means. I'm Jay Fidel, and I was originally a New Yorker. And for a time, Ken Rogers and I were New Yorkers together. And that was before most of you were born. This is Think Tech. <laughs> and we're talking about community matters, about a community that has long since passed. Um, because after how many years? 60 years, uh, Ken and I went for a reunion to the, all the old places in lower Manhattan and upper Manhattan, for that matter, in memory lane. And it was a great reunion just only a week or two ago. And we wanted to tell you what we found, the changes we found in, you can't call it the underside of New York City 60 years later. Um, hi, Ken. Hi, Jay. <laughs> I, I thought we were going to, you know, kick the old tires, except when we got there, none of the tires were there. <laughs> Exactly. That's, that's the message here. So Ken and I were at the uh, Joe Weinstein Hall, which is brand new at the time, at the intersection of Washington Place and what is it, uh, Leaker Street, I guess. Um, and we were uh, resident uh, counselors, graduate counselors there. And we had two floors of uh, undergraduates uh, who were our charges. The place was brand new, spanking clean. It was co-ed, men on one side of a courtyard, women on the other side. It couldn't have been nicer. It couldn't have been prettier. And it was in, you know, the Greenwich Village. Uh, uh, that, was, that was then at the time really famous. Uh, it, was the, it was the time of Jack Kerouac. It was the time of the, the hippies. It was the time of um, some very rich people who lived at the foot of Fifth Avenue, only a block away, uh, and Washington Muse, which had great historical value. And it was catty corner across Washington Square uh, from NYU Law School, where I went to school. And, and Ken's school was a graduate business school, GBA, down on Wall Street, uh, right near Trinity Church. But all that has changed. And we went together to look. And Ken, what did we find to our amazement, our disappointment, our chagrin, and our revelation? Well, some things were disappointing, uh, and others were not so disappointing. Uh, for example, uh, Weinstein Hall, a, a wonderful place where uh, we got to uh, allegedly uh, be in charge of a bunch of undergraduates, but um, uh, the whole feeling of that place was totally different when you walked in the front door, the first thing you were confronted with was security, more security, and additional security. And, and there was no way that it even looked like the, the nice, open, welcoming place that, uh, that I remember so fondly. Uh, it uh, did not seem to be we uh, well up kept. Uh, the um, People were pleasant enough, but it really just uh, was not uh, an inviting place at all. Uh, they were doing some renovations that might give them a bit of an excuse, but I thought uh, compared to the other pieces of uh, New York University that we saw, uh, it, it you know most of the other places were an improvement or they were better, uh, they were cleaner, they they felt nicer, but. Uh, but Weinstein Hall didn't feel nice at all. If I were, you know, a senior executive in the um, NYU system, I would feel that that's a disgrace compared to the rest. Yeah, I, I agree. You know, it's that whole thing with uh, posting little notices with scotch tape on the walls um, about some event or some activity and leaving it there for months, for years after the activity has taken place. Um, and I agree with you about the security. Gee, there were so many people. And, and um, some of them were friendly, as you say, and even, you know, worth chatting up, but others were not friendly. And, and that's because of COVID. It's because of, you know, the threat of violence by people with guns. Um, and so, you know, NYU reacts that way, as a lot of, a lot of schools do. Um, and the same thing at the law school. You know, I went to the law school. There's somebody who had taught there recently uh, as a, an adjunct uh, told me that my name would be in a big book, uh, a book of graduates of NYU Law School. And I went there twice, one for um, you know, uh, uh, an LLB time, 
and then later on for an LLM. And indeed, I walked in and I told the guy, I was uh, the security guy, that I was in the book. And he looked me up and there I was twice in the book. And then I told him that I had been advised that, uh, you know, if I was in the book, uh, then I could walk around and say hi and whatnot, go see my, my old classrooms, uh, even my teachers, if they were still alive, probably not. <laughs> and, then, and then I said, well, now that I'm in the book, can I walk around? And he said, you have been misinformed. Um, <laughs> you, you cannot walk around uh, because then, you know, to the extent that system, you know, uh, was in place uh, before COVID, it is not in place now. And you know, you're going to have to leave now, even though you're in the book. And I said, well, look, look, I, I need I need to uh, go to the bathroom. So <laughs> could, I, could I walk across the hall and go to the bathroom? And he said, well, <laughs> since you spent six years at NYU paying all the tuition and studying late at night, why don't we let you go to the bathroom? So I went to the bathroom. And, and Ken, I'm here to tell you, the bathroom is very nice. And I came out of the bathroom and I said to him, you know, six years and all that tuition and studying late at night and two graduation ceremonies, uh, I finally got a chance to pee on NYU. And, <laughs> and that, was, that was really very gratifying. Um, it, was a, it was a great bathroom and it was nice of him to let me do that. So suffice to say, it's all about security, as you said, and it's all about COVID. And so, um, you know, universities, especially universities, um, downtown like that, and you know, in Greenwich Village, they're they're different now. In fact, the whole neighborhood was different, wasn't it? Yeah, it really was. I found uh, that um, the general neighborhood was a lot cleaner than I remember. Uh, you know, one of my uh, you know ancient thoughts about New York City was it was a pretty filthy place in terms of you know um, stuff on the street. Uh, the streets all look very clean, particularly Washington Square Park, I thought, uh, you know, was uh, very attractive. The um, uh, One of the interesting factors in that neighborhood was that uh, the New York University has obviously had a, uh, a lot of endowment money since I was there because they own a large number of the buildings surrounding the area and they're very well kept. Uh, they, they looked uh, uh, pretty sparkling, um, but on the uh, Washington Square itself, I found uh, there were, was nobody looked like a beatnik, which was, you know, a very common uh, looking person back in the 1960s, the early 60s. Um, the, um, but you had every type of person you could think of. And one of the unique things about Washington Square Park, it was, it was so busy that, uh, that the people watching was, was really the dominant, um, thing that was happening. And that, uh, compared to anywhere else in New York, when you saw some, you know, young lady from, you know, age eight to to 60, they didn't have their hand in front of them with a phone as they were walking along. Uh, they, were, they were too busy, uh, as were you and I, uh, watching all of the people. Uh, you know, I can remember crossing Washington Square Park in the a, in a middle of the day in a, on a weekday, and you'd have, a, a, you know, a few people sitting around uh, playing chess, you know, and it was pretty quiet. Uh, you'd walk all the way across and, and uh, you know, you'd not uh, have the, the monstrous uh, crowds of people that were there. It was very enjoyable. To... Yeah. Um, I told you my, my story with uh, Paul Simon. I went to Paul, I went to school with Paul Simon, you know, before I went to college. Uh, I was in grade school with him, in high school with him, and Art Garfunkel. In fact, they were they were stars in the city music, the you know the New York City music scene, uh, in, even in high school. Um, the, uh, I forget their band name, but they had a band, and um, and uh, they had a song that was a top song. Anyway, um, at one point in high school, Paul asked me if I would join their band uh, and sing with them. <laughs> 
I said, no. It's no, lucky no. you didn't. Probably, well, maybe, maybe, <laughs> maybe not. And Garfunkel <laughs> yeah. said, yeah, why don't you join us, Jay? You know, you could, you could, uh, you know, be part of our group. And uh, you can hit a number one, you know, citywide hit also. <clears throat> and I said, no, no, I can't do that. I got to go to law school. Okay, uh, fast forward to law school. So just as you say, people would play chess and it was quiet in Washington Square Park. And, and Paul, you know, wasn't doing much. Uh, as I recall, he went to Queens College with me. I saw him in Queens College and Garfunkel went to Columbia. And so this was a kind of reunion. I met him around the fountain there in the center of Washington Square Park. And we sat on the fountain and it was quiet. It was intimate, if you will, sitting on the fountain and, you know, having a rendezvous, talk about the good old days. And um, I said, how you doing, Paul? He says, I'm terrible. I don't have a job, you know, and, I, and I'm not in school right now. And I don't know what I'm going to do with my life. I have no idea where I'm going. And he said, I really envy you, Jay, that you're in law school, um, you know, across the way here at NYU. And uh, I'm not. Um, and, I, and I hope I can find something equally useful to do. I'll never forget that meeting because it was shortly thereafter, within a year anyway, that the graduate played. And all of a sudden, Simon and Garfunkel were catapulted, you know, to national, international fame um, with, with their music um, in The Graduate. And guess what? Guess what, Ken? I wasn't in The Graduate. I wasn't in their band. I wasn't, <laughs> I wasn't there. I, I was still banging my brains out in law school. So well, there you go. That was the nature of Washington Square Park in those days. <laughs> So what, what did you feel about the masks? You know, we walked around and we saw all these people in New York City um, and it was still COVID, you know, the New York uh, was having a surge of COVID. But what are what, what, what people doing about the mask? Well, it was, it was hit and miss. There, were, there was um, lots of people with the mask, but an awful lot without. Uh, in the Washington Square Park area where there were these large crowds, uh, you know, there were not very many people with masks. Uh, whereas, um, you know, we at um, one of the big theaters in uh, Midtown Manhattan, uh, one of the, they required masks in the theater and everybody was uh, right on board. I mean, there were not people with the mask below their nose and the kind of thing you see, mm -hmm. you know, from some of the obstinate people that you run into all the time. There didn't seem to be that the lack of, of cooperation at all in that theater, you know, but I was surprised, uh, you know, as we approached the theater, you know, we went by, uh, you know, the one of the fire exits and uh, and there were, you know, two policemen there, you know, or extra security guards and, you know, got the feeling that uh, the security type of thing that we had encountered elsewhere applied in all kinds of places in New York that wasn't there 60 years ago. Oh, no. What do you think of the play, The Music Man? What do you think of the play, Ken? It, it was super to go, you know, to a New York theater where it's so large. Uh, I enjoyed the dance. The dancing part of that play was was exceptional. Uh, they have a very good uh, theater in in Kelowna in British Columbia, even though it's a it's a teeny weeny city compared to New York. Uh, but they don't have the the scale, like the number of of actors that are out there, you know, doing the dancing. The choreography and dancing was outstanding. Um, I was very surprised with the crowd, though, that the crowd cheered at anything and everything. You know, that, they sounds, were, that sounds like Honolulu. They do the same thing here. Whatever, whatever they do on the stage, the crowd is giving them a standing ovation. And, and indeed, there was a very long standing ovation after this play was over, wasn't it? Yeah. Well, I mean, I can remember, you know, theater. Uh, even though when I was there 60 years ago, I was uh, poor as a church mouse, so I didn't get to go to the theater too often. But uh, but then there were only cheering and clapping when it was deserved. Uh, you know, that's the standard that we have in Canada, is, or at least in my area in Canada, is, is if something 
is really good, they get a clap and they wait and, you know, not not as often as was done in that huge theater in uh, in Midtown Manhattan. Yeah, the Winter Garden. But, you know, it isn't always thus. I remember going to, I was telling you, I remember going to Tosca, uh, the opera at the Metropolitan Opera, and um, the crowd didn't like the performance. I liked it. I thought it was just fine. My wife liked it. She thought it was just fine. But the crowd were all, you know, opera devotees, and they knew a thing or two about opera. And when it was over, they booed. They booed. They booed all the players. They booed the orchestra. They booed everybody. <laughs> so, you know, it doesn't always thus. It depends on who the crowd is and, and how good the performance is in their eyes. Yeah. So um, yeah, now so let's let's move downtown a little bit. Um, so uh, we went looking for a, a GBA, the Graduate Business Administration School, where you took your your PhD, and um, uh, you know uh, it was not in the same location. They moved. It, it. wasn't there. <laughs> it didn't exist in in the Wall Street area, which really really surprised me because when I went. Uh, uh, virtually all of the students that uh, were in uh, either a master's or doctoral program at NYU Business School, um, they were all part-time students. All the classes were, you know, in the evenings. And um, the first year I was there was really the, uh, the first year that they ever had full-time day students. Um, I took most of my classes uh, along with the part-time students at night, but all the part-time students were were um, <clears throat> people that worked in the Wall Street area for the most part. So that uh, when you had a class that started at 5.30, they'd kind of walk over from their office and and go to class. And, you know, there was a class from 5.30 to 7.30 and another from 7.30 to 9.30 every uh, weekday and uh and that was how how i went to school uh you know that was the timing that i went because that's when all the 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 really good classes were on and the big big name profs were available and so i tried to always get into the classes that had the the real experts uh you know at that time uh and and still NYU ranks uh, so highly in the finance area compared to all of the colleges in the world. Uh, you know, I suppose it's not surprising since it was New York City and it was in the Wall Street area. But when they moved that uh, graduate business school to the Greenwich Village area, it would be pretty difficult for for executives that worked or let's call it employees in the Wall Street area to get to Greenwich Village to get to the classes there. What it wouldn't it be, it would not be as convenient. So I don't know how their enrollment has changed in terms of those part-time students, and, but you know, they still seem to have the ranking in the area of finance. Now, I had the same experience in the NYU uh, graduate LLM tax program. Um, that all the classes uh, were in the evening, and um, you know the students came from Wall Street. They managed to get uptown, and and they came directly from their law firm offices or their government offices. Um, and uh, it was quite it was quite different than it is now. I think now you have these graduate programs, and they they're all day long, uh, and it's it's uh, difficult to get those those same people to come up from Wall Street uh, at the at the time of the classes. So it's different. I, I don't know exactly how different, but it's different. So we also went to uh, one Vanderbilt, uh, one Vanderbilt Avenue, I think it is, um, and that is a huge building, ninety-six stories, um, as big or maybe bigger than the Empire State Building, which is not far away. Uh, it was it was a really interesting experience to go that high in a building that was built that was dedicated. Um, to visitors, tourists, and guys like you and me who wanted to see for miles and miles and miles. What did you think of that? It was, it was a fantastic building. It's, it's pretty startling to be looking out a window and looking down 
at the uh, observation deck in the uh, Empire State Building, which was, you know, not that far away, um, uh, of greater surprise to me, and sort of another one of the main changes, was that um, one of the most gorgeous buildings when I was in New York uh, 60 years ago was called the Pan Am Building. And it it's the one that uh, kind of straddles or it's right behind Grand Central Station. Well, this uh, new building, uh, one Vanderbilt uh, called the Summit, um, from the observation deck, you look down at the roof of that building that's now called Met or Met Life Building. Anyhow, it's Met Life that that dominates it. But the top of that building was a heliport, and and I can remember, you know, as a uh, a poverty stricken student thinking that uh, you know it would be really quite something to be able to land on the top of that building and and you know a couple of years after i had graduated and and had earned enough money to be able to at least uh, pay for an airplane etc uh, and i took my wife to new york and and you know as a special treat landed on the top of that building and I was startled to find out that they don't use that heliport anymore, uh, you know, because these buildings are are taller than it. I don't know <laughs> why, but obviously uh, somebody would call it a security question. But, uh, you know, they probably not, uh, you know, I've watched enough helicopters copters land in emergency scenarios to know that, you know, those pilots could land on a, you know, on a teeny weeny, you know, somebody's backyard without hitting anything. Um, but, uh, you know, obviously, um, for security reasons, they don't allow that. Yeah. But it's kind of startling to look down upon a heliport that used to exist at, the, and it was 70 floors in the air. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about uh, the Statue of Liberty. We went to the Statue of Liberty. It was a really hot day and a million tourists around. Um, and we, we had to take a boat. The boat uh, stopped at the Statue of Liberty, Liberty Island, and the Ellis Island the, with the immigration building there from the, around the turn of the century. Um, that was really interesting. And I have to admit to you, I hadn't been there, if at all, for many, many, many years. What was your impression of, of the Statue of Liberty? Well, was a lot bigger than I thought it was. <laughs> uh, you know, I had um, taken a um, oh, a little cruise around the, the New York Harbor in the same time that I had taken my wife there. But, uh, you know, it was, you know, a I think it was five cents cost to ride the Staten Island Ferry back mm -hmm. across the harbor and back, you know, and that was what we did at the time. Um, but, um, the, everybody, uh, everybody took their dates to Staten Island because for 10 cents, well, I guess it's 20 cents, you know, round trip, <laughs> you could have this beautiful view of New York Harbor, um, and be on a ferry. It was all very romantic. Everybody took the Staten Island ferry. <laughs> I, I would assume that with the Verrazano Narrows Bridge, that doesn't, uh, exist anymore. You know, oh, no, I think they still have that. Uh, I'm not sure. But we didn't but see I it. But I doubt that it still costs a nickel. <laughs> uh, totally. Totally. <laughs> I did see Governor's Island, though, from our, our, our boat, and that was interesting because I spent some time in the service uh, on Governor's Island. It's, it's no longer a Coast Guard base, but it is still a very impressive island in the middle of New York Harbor. Um, moving, moving on, though, we not only saw Washington Square Park, which was the circus, as you described it, um, but also we went to we went to um, Central Park, and uh, we walked around there. And, uh, and of course, the, there was a similarity between Central Park and Washington Square Park. But what did you think of Central Park? It is certainly the center of Manhattan. Uh, well, I was um, very cognizant of the difference in the people from Washington Square Park to Central Park. Central Park. Certainly, the the southern area of it that the that we were at, uh, it was very much a family 
type of place. There was a lot of small kids. There were very few um, kids in Washington Square Park. Uh, you know, they were perhaps uh, the odd one was uh, son or daughter of a tourist. You know, but most of the people in Washington Square Park looked like they were local New Yorkers. You know, uh, where everybody in um, in Central Park looked like a New Yorker and looked like they were there with a family outing. Mm -hmm. uh, That's a tremendous park, um, uh, really a people's park. Every city should have a park like Central Park. So much going on, so inviting, actually. But um, you know, uh, before we run out of time, I wanna I wanna ask you about my neighborhood. Um, you were kind enough to accompany me back to my neighborhood. Uh, on the best mode of transportation we could find, namely mm, the subway, <laughs> <laughs> which is actually a very, very efficient system um, and uh, relatively cheap and fast and no traffic jams on the subway. So we, we went out to my, my uh, ancestral home, if you will, um, back in Queens, and I showed you my schools when I was a kid. I showed you my, my streets, my neighborhood. Uh, and of course, you... You didn't see it then, as I did, you know, 60, 70, 80 years ago. Um, but let me tell you, there were things that were remarkably similar, the same, unchanged. And there were also things that reflected, um, you know, the, the, new, the new world, the new New York, the new country we live in. And, and I guess that's um, a, a piece I want to ask you about. What did you think of Forest Hills and Regal Park and Queens as an expression of diversity? as an expression of middle-class living, as, as an expression of a, you know, a, 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 a prosperous, if, well, I don't know if prosperous may not be the right word, but a, a thriving, a thriving community. Well, um, my definition of a, of a middle-class community is, is very different than a New Yorker. Um, that, uh, you know, I come from or was born and raised uh, in a city called Calgary in Alberta, you know, which is now about 1.6 million people. But uh, but everybody lives in a single family home in a suburb as opposed to, you know, the apartments or something that are basically a new way of living, a, a condominium. Uh, the percentage of people in condominiums is is very low where um everything in queens was a condominium but the startling piece to me and kind of got the hint on the way there as i don't know which cab driver we had a couple of cabs but one was was from nepal and and another one was from uzbekistan <laughs> well you know i tend to think that uh, that vancouver and kelowna you know, in, in the areas where I, you know, near where I live or in Calgary, um, that um, they're very cosmopolitan type places, but you don't run into people from, you know, very, very unusual places. So New York's still kind of a melting pot. And, you know, when we got to Queens, uh, you know, there was a there was a, a theater that you had mentioned you you and your brother used to go to, you know, and it was a a Russian community center type of thing uh, that there was um, clearly, you know, a change in in uh, the, uh, you know, ethnic population with a, you know, fair emphasis from, um, you know, whoever was there when you were there to, you know, a lot of uh, new immigrants from the, uh, you know, old Soviet Union era. Yeah, a lot of Russians there. But, um, you know, it changed gradually because every time I've been there, I've noticed more and more that uh, it's very diverse. And in fact, it's become, uh, what do they call it? The uh, bedroom community for the United Nations. Indeed, in every single language, you know, every single culture, every single country, all represented and you know it's a swell neighborhood i wouldn't mind living there and by the same token when we were walking around in manhattan i remember there was there was one street corner where you could hear any language every language and i turned to you and i said ken is there anybody here that speaks english because <laughs> it wasn't clear that anyone in the anyone down the block spoke english 
Um, New York is very diverse, and it's not only diverse in terms of, you know, the ethnicities that, that live in the, the country, it's diverse in, in all these people come from all other countries. Um, and they all manage, they all get jobs, they all get housing, and uh, maybe tougher for some of them than others. But the fact is, it's a relatively friendly, um, relatively, mm, what's the word I'm looking for, tolerant kind of place. And we had, you and I, we, we like to chat people up, right? We like to chat up strangers. We had oh, so many really, fun conversations. It was really easy. Uh, you know, it certainly uh, was a very welcoming uh, community. And uh, the people were really friendly. You know, some had accents so thick, you had a little trouble understanding what they were saying. But, uh, you know, they certainly tried hard to communicate and be friendly. Yeah. So we're, we're uh, out of time, I'm afraid. Uh, we could go on as we did in New York, which was a wonderful trip. It's such a nice reunion. And it's so nice to see you now to talk about it. We could go on for a long time, just um, you know, kind of examining what happened and, and finding conclusions and lessons in, in that trip. But let me ask you one last question. What's your, what's your general impression of it? What's your takeaway? What would you tell people about this trip um, you know, to explain the the change, the delta factor between then 60 years ago and now, uh, and our experience in, in sort of re-entering the city after all this time. Well, when I was a student there, and, and I really thought, you know, New York was not a, a great place to visit. You know, I just thought it was, you know, a big hustling, bustling place. Uh, and um, that uh, going as a visitor was really, really a lot of fun. It really is a nice place to visit. <laughs> but, but you wouldn't want to live there. There was an article in the paper a couple of weeks ago about how a, a studio or a one bedroom in the East Village, and we walked in the East Village, uh, make that the West Village, I'm sorry, uh, goes for $4,000 a month. Really small, really small apartment. And so you wonder how, how you can make enough money to support a lifestyle with that and, as the rent. And then, of course, food isn't cheap. Restaurants aren't cheap. Nothing is cheap. Um, on the other hand, um, you, you learn. You learn to be parsimonious. <laughs> you learn to negotiate. You learn to only buy what you need, that sort of thing. <laughs> well, it was a great experience, Ken. I really uh, I was so happy to meet you there. Thank you for coming to meet me. And uh, we had a wonderful time, unforgettable. I'm still, I'm still living through it. My memories are still popping up at any hour of the day of, of our rendezvous in New York. And I hope we can get to do it again. Well, everybody here says, so, you know, you know since my, uh, you live in Hawaii, why the heck would I meet you in New York? Go to Hawaii instead. <laughs> so anyhow, uh, that, that's the impression of my neighbors. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ken Rogers. Ken Rogers was my roommate in the early 60s at NYU uh, in Weinstein, Joe Weinstein Hall. And we had so much fun, uh, such a good time together in the days of the, the hippies in Washington Square Park, just a few feet away. Thank you so much, Ken. Talk to you soon. So long. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.